All right, my name is James Daly. I am going to be talking today uh, about CBDCs. Uh, um, these are central bank digital currencies. So I'm, if you're here because you're expecting a, a bunch of other people to be talking, my apologies. I was not able to get other folks on, uh, but uh, you, I'll have a short presentation, and then hopefully we can get to some questions and answers. All right, how do I move this forward? All right, so what is a CBDC? Okay, so I think the simplest way to think about this is that your bank account is a digital um, representation of your physical, of the physical banknotes. It's okay, Javier, I got this. Maybe drop on, come on later when we, uh, when we get to Q&A. Cool. Um, CBDCs are conceptually uh, in fact, when we started, first started talking about CBDCs, we talked about uh, stable coins. So uh, these were crypto uh, cryptocurrencies that were uh, linked one to one to the value of a fiat currency. And so uh, these are CBDCs are in a sense stable coins that are run or managed by central banks. And by way of analogy, uh, metal coins are a form of physical currency, right? And they're they're actually stamped by a different agency that prints money. So in a similar way, you could think of as CBDCs as being issued separately from the physical, the printed and stamped currency in a country. Um, and, and of course, it's 100% digital. So... Uh, the other key point here is that they're intended as legal tender. So unlike bitcoins, which um, or other cryptocurrencies, there isn't a an expectation that someone must accept uh, the form of currency that you present to them. It, it, with uh, cryptocurrencies, it's an option. And so when you think of CBDCs, think about the requirement to be legal tender. And interestingly enough, since this is the Finerac group, uh, they are conceptualized as a tool for financial inclusion. And we're gonna come back to that. What is interesting is how quickly these things have come upon the, the scene. Um, so the Bank of International Settlements, oh, this is, Odd. I thought the sizing was not related to that. Okay, apparently it is. Um, oh, it's just the aspect. Okay. Um, Cent Bank for International Settlements, right, is the BIS, is the central bank of central banks. And the Bank of International Settlements puts out policies for payment systems and for uh, you know, how systems are to relate to each other. Uh, they're really uh, a policy shop, and they also operationally handle the settlement, large settlements that it, on a on a minute-by-minute minute basis for all the central banks in the world. They maintain the stability of the international um, financial system. So it's really interesting to see them uh, come along, come around to this notion that, yep, central banks, you all need to get into the game. So what their, what this one uh, speech given quite recently by uh, Benoit Curé, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, um, he's basically saying time has passed for central banks to get going. And it, they anticipate it will take years, which I think is accurate. Um, but uh, they also acknowledge that cryptocurrencies and stable coins are already there, and that adds some urgency to the issue. Uh, it's interesting that they're also, I think, um, reacting to the announcements um, by the Chinese um, government which has already, you know, uh, begun their own, well, they might call it a pilot, but a rollout of a central bank digital currency. So in some sense, the BIS is reacting to what's already going on. 
So what are some of the features that are needed? So it needs to be easy to use, low cost, convertible to other currencies, other types of payment mechanisms. You need to have instant settlement with no counterparty risk. Continuously processed um, so that, you know, there isn't a, a lag uh, or a, a period of time when you don't know whether things are processed. High degree of security, resilience, et cetera. We'll get into these things. It has to be scalable, fast, open, and offline. Now, offline is a super interesting one because when they say offline, they don't mean offline like the credit card uh, processors think of offline. When they think of offline, they're really thinking about a, uh, a, a, a high latency thing, but they require the transactions to get online in order to be, uh, in order to be valid. Um, there are other notions being introduced for CBDCs that are not uh, in line with that. It's actually more completely uh, and, and, and entirely offline. So uh, I thought this was an interesting um, description of some choices and some consumer needs. So you can think of CBDCs as the digital cash, right? And so it has to be, so from the bottom up, cash-like, and you need to be able to use it peer to peer. So you can't, um, you, you, you must have this kind of, of concept built into the protocols, built into the, into the form factors, built into the networks, built into uh, the account um, holding mechanisms. Uh, it has to be more like cash. And so, you know, and so what is the role of the central bank in that? Um, well, that gets to this question of whether you have a one-tier or a two-tiered system. So in its purest form, you could imagine the central bank setting up accounts for every uh, person in their country, uh, a citizen or refugee or immigrant or whatever their status, legal status is. Anybody in their borders could be given an account with the central bank and that that person then would be able to directly transact uh, because they have a an account with one institution it's called the central bank now this notion was um i, th I think this notion has been somewhat rejected and we'll come back to that but that's an architectural choice so do you have direct claims to the central bank digital currencies or indirect claims um, and when you have indirect claims, do you set up separate uh, ledgers for that? And if you're setting up se separate ledgers, then what's the role of a, of a DLT? So then you come up to the next level, right? So if it's distributed, uh, isn't, the isn't that the same thing as having um, claims on a central system? It might be. Or you might have commercial... Um, uh, commercial banks in between, commercial banks that hold the central bank digital currencies, uh, and then you know there's a distribution mechanism. Uh, ensuring privacy, uh, this is super interesting. Um, of course, we have uh, the ability uh, with a digital currency to to trace. Uh, and to have a full audit log of who's touched that currency. So unlike a $20 bill, which can change hands many times, with no record of who's touched it, uh, with central bank digital currencies, you can have that. And so do you want that? And that's a design choice. Do you want to have cross-border payments made easier? One of the, one of the most frictionful set of transactions globally are retail international remittance. We've all heard of the high transaction fees paid there. So as I said, I think the two tiered system is, is looking more likely. Um, this is from the dollar project. Uh, this is the notion. So you'll see there, 
but the central, the Federal, Re Federal Reserve Bank, Central Bank of the United States, you know, prints cash. And the cash goes out to uh, the commercial banking sector. And those are, res those are the reserves that are held at the, at the banks. And then the cash is then distributed in various channels to the individuals and businesses, et cetera. Uh, so in the same way, the digital dollars would uh, be distributed to the commercial banks, and they would then uh, provide those digital dollars uh, to their customers, um, and that would that would get the whole system going. So interestingly enough, the, the Federal Reserve would still have the role of minting the currency, so creating the digital tokens, um, and, or uh, entries in a ledger, um, although I do think tokenization is likely. Um, and they'd also have the responsibility of, of burning them. So in the sense that you would burn cash to take it out of circulation, you'd also have to have a mechanism to uh, to handle the excess or to handle the, the lost, um, lost tokens, uh, no, sorry, not lost tokens, but tokens that have, um, that you would want to retire after a certain period of time, perhaps. Um, although, you know, what's the theoretical limit on on that? Probably would have to do with the embedded uh, embedded protocols. So, another key question is: What would a central bank digital currency to another CBDC look like? So, last uh, actually just a few months ago, um, a French bank and the uh, and the monetary authority of Singapore and one of the commercial banks there experimented um, at a conceptual level and then they ran a little um, tech demo where they wanted to see what it would be like. So one of the key things here is um, is this notion of foreign exchange um, um, what's it called payment to payment. So, for a payment received in one currency, you must have a corresponding payment received by the other currency, uh, and that needs to happen in you know near real time so that you don't have um, you know risk involved in the transaction um, not not finalizing. Uh, and this actually comes out of a set of policies that the the Bank of International Settlements has set up. So um, in the um, Actually, in the wake of I think a like a 1970s problem where one bank was in the middle of a bunch of transactions and 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 was basically uh, didn't have the funds, and so it crashed. It had it had liabilities um, spread throughout the international banking system, and they said, okay, right, we need to have a design where um, once somebody has sent funds in one currency, the payment needs to come back within a certain period of time. Um, there are these windows, there are these uh, cap amounts and et cetera. So, so they ran this process with CBDCs um, in order to demonstrate that, yeah, we can do the same thing um, blockchain to blockchain um, uh, and uh, using, these, using these concepts. So I think that's interesting. They're, they've started to design that. There are, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of projects ongoing. You can look at this, I think it's called Geo, GeoEcon at GitHub, and they have a CBDC tracker, um, which uh, I think gives you a fairly accurate view of what's going on. Um, the sand dollar in, uh, in the Caribbean, of course, is probably the one that well, a bunch of people have heard of that one. Um, China has launched something that they've calling a pilot, but it really does look like a rollout. Um, uh, you have uh, lots of other folks that are, you know, doing research, um, including U.S. Federal Reserve, including um, uh, well, many other many other countries. So um, this seems to be something that is coming. I'm not going to say it's coming fast because these are, after all, governments that work at the speed that they can, and with some good deliberation, which is probably good. So an interesting um, challenge was presented globally. It's called the 
So the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MASS, is sort of known as a, a place where fintechs and innovation in this space and similar are uh, hosted. And they issued 12 problem statements and, and they had something like 300 responders. Um, it, the team that I'm a part of was actually one of the 15 groups selected to uh, as a finalist. Um, I'm not going to necessarily talk too much about that, but I think that the way that they're talking about these problem statements is is important and, and how these things are solved technologically will influence where CBDCs go, um, you know, go in, into the future. So new functionalities versus inclusivity. So this one really goes to this notion uh, of financial inclusion. You can't you don't want to have a, a solution that only works for the people with smartphones. So essentially, you know, it might be somewhat easy to have, you know, a smartphone driven approach to this where, you know, you just assume everybody's online, you assume everybody has a smartphone, with a certain amount of minimal processing. And you might say, well, you know, in five years, that's gonna reach 80% of the people. Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean. The price point for phones um, is still a, a very high for folks, um, and despite you know being an optimist about data networks, uh, they do seem to have an endpoint, uh, and there are lots and lots of places on the planet where you do not have good good um, good connectivity. And even with satellite kinds of solutions coming in, uh, it still seems likely that for the foreseeable future, you will still have places that cannot transact, which is kind of a non-starter. Um, you have to be able to solve this. Um, so you have to be able to form factors and technologies that can truly operate without connectivity, at least for a period of time. And uh, this is also true during a disaster. If your entire currency system goes down because your electricity is out, that's not a good thing. Uh, and uh, you know we have enough trouble with that uh, when we have storms, but imagine something that lasts for, for weeks. So cash is a good thing, and we probably won't ever replace cash, perhaps, but CBDCs are, to, to be cash-like, they need to be able to, to have these kind of features. Uh, security versus accessibility. Um, so you would not want to uh, have something that's so easy, so accessible to folks that they're able to like spoof and and um, uh, and and basically use however they want. There has to be security, but too much security and you make it unusable. And so that's a common tension availability versus risk of accessibility. Um, um, so offline transactions um, uh, is um, a key part of this. So if you are able to offer something that is offline, then at the end of the transaction, you need to make sure that that transaction is, you know, good funds in the hands of a merchant or in the hands of a consumer. You can't have um, something that's offline that then risks up all these disputes later on. So you have to solve for that. Recoverability. Um, there needs to be some way to recover funds. Uh, perhaps it could be completely anonymous, but if you want to have recoverability, you have to know who is entitled to those funds. So that's that issue. Um, the frictionless use versus control. So this is an interesting one. It was alluded to in another talk yesterday. If you make this so easy for folks to get into, there is the potential that folks would, would essentially run to the CBDCs, emptying out the banking system of funds, of existing cash funds. And this becomes particularly problematic if your government without any sort of, uh, without a CBDC or 
you're a smaller con country and people run to the dollar issued CBDCs. So there's a lot of there are a lot of governments looking at this saying, well, how do we prevent people from moving to CBDCs uh, if we don't have one ourselves? That that I think is a, a, a super interesting control um, versus frictionless use problem. Um, personal data protection. Again, this sort of goes to this issue of um, privacy, but it's at the distribution level. So it's um, how do we make sure that data protection is taken seriously across the entire um, network? Expanding access versus guarding um, against data monopolies. So there's already a concentration of, of uh, you know, data and, uh, you know, GPI, um, what am I trying to say, the, um, the European Privacy Act um, has policies, but how do you enforce those kinds of policies when you've got this, this uh, design of a system that has all the information about every transaction you've, you've ever made or every transaction everybody has ever made? Um, those are some big, big data privacy issues. Um, extensibility, you know, this one, um, sorry, going a little bit out of order here. Um, no, let's go to coexistence. So do you try to provide direct interface to banking systems, to the banking system functionalities that um, exist on the fiat side, on the physical cash side, or do you try to keep this somewhat um, separate you know, how do you integrate? How do you move money between them? This goes to some of the interoperability questions at the distribution side. Infrastructure, uh, decentralization versus accountability. You know, this, um, this is the question of, uh, do you have a set of authorities um, that manage this uh, at a, centralized level you know do you have delegated authority do you have simply a set of rules how do you how do you manage the overall system uh, operational resilience um, goes to this question as well of um, so extensibility really refers to in some sense the smart contracts uh, the ability to embed within the, the, the central bank digital currencies the uh, contract terms to limit or to uh, to enforce certain spending um, kinds of tracking. Uh, and then privacy versus performance. There's, of course, um, you, you could collect all sorts of data, but then you know, you might slow down the transaction to such a degree that it becomes unusable. And then interoperability versus standardization. Um, what happens when everybody has their own CBDC? So, you know, do we want one standard? Do we need multiple standard um, standards? You know, what's the old saying? Um, great thing about standards is that everybody's got one. So those are the 12 problems that um, the team that I'm on and other teams have been um, trying to solve. We've been trying to solve one or more of them. Uh, and the, the Monetary Authority of Singapore will be uh, holding a FinTech thing in early November. You can look it up. Uh, and they'll be releasing a, a report on this as well. So there'll be some follow-up that will talk about how these problem statements are being resolved by these different teams. So here at a, at a high level is how we can think about some of the architectural elements. So um, if it's not clear already, there are state authorities involved in this. So not like a cryptocurrency, but state authorities are very much involved, probably setting up the minting operations, the creation, you know, sort of the zero um, authorization key and and doing some of those initial setup things they'll be the ones uh, defining the smart contracts or maybe maybe not the only ones they'll be defining the policies how do these 
How do these CBDCs get settled? Uh, how do they go out? How do they come back to the central bank? Um, do we do we have um, sufficient data uh, about the transactions? Do we have too much data? They'll enforce the privacy rules, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a fairly key role, I think, at the central bank because it'll some of these things will be embedded by policy in the mechanisms. Um, and some of the things will then be embedded in, in the banks um, and the third party providers. So then you have a network of DLT servers out there. And these, these are the, these can be run by a vendor. So there's a lot of vendors out there trying to um, build a system that would then be um, procured by the central bank so that, you know, essentially the central bank is owning the operations, but the vendor is running it for them. It's a, it's a common setup. The participating regula regulated entities, meaning banks or other non-banking financial institutions, you know, these would have the account balances. They'd be able to do account control. They'd, they'd have, um, they'd be managing essentially this distribution of uh, CBDCs. They'd also be responsible in this sort of typical setup but for KYC, uh, AML and CFT. So these acronyms refer to things around customer due diligence. Another another acronym, acronym CDD. Know your customer, probably familiar with the folks, um, anti-money laundering and counter the financing of terrorism. So these are all different um, sides of the same coin, <laughs> three-sided coin. Uh, and they are they are res responsibility of, of any institution that opens up an, an account um, or transacts with another account. So in between the regulated entity and some delivery mechanisms or channel mechanisms, we might have the account information service providers and the payment information service providers. And this is sort of where I think it gets interesting, where we don't really know what's going to happen in this space. Um, this is the retail side of things. This is where you have, um, you want to have offline and high latency storage of transactions. You might have some device standards. You might require a certain amount of cryptography there. Um, and then you might have online versions of this, which um, is sort of the simpler things. And those are the instant and immediate payment systems, another acronym there. So at a high level, this is how it might look in a, in an economy, um, and the uh, and the AISP and PISP are, are probably known to people who have worked in open banking. These are the concepts that are, are now out there, and uh, it's how the European um, uh, payments uh, system is run. Okay, um, um, a note about interoperability. I, I've alluded to it a couple of times, but you know, interoperability means a lot of different things. And I liked this diagram by um, Arish Natharajan, um, just recently saw this. So it's, um, it means a lot of different things. So in the context of large volume, it means the, um, you know, the ability for uh, for funds to get, sorry, large volume payments in the, in, in G2P, it's, it's the choice of delivery, um, mechanisms. And so in a lot of countries that I've worked in, the government has just one channel, one state bank. And so if you are receiving a beneficiary benefit payment, you have to go to that bank. Well, interoperability in that context would mean you could go to any bank or any mobile money provider and get your funds. Interoperability and fast payments is you should have interoperability between the bank accounts and wallets. Um, and there's a related project uh, that I've spoken about before called Moja Loop, which is a open source switch. And that's what it's really um, solving. It's solving this, uh, you know, the ability to connect to multiple types of accounts in an economy, not just banks. A lot of the banking structures are geared towards that uh interoperability at a at the uh at the form factor 
um, and and at the and the type of funds being used. So this would be the CBDC interoperability with physical cash. So what's that look like? Uh, I've mentioned open banking, and then of course there's interoperability at the device level. I also want to highlight the the double spend problem. So this one is well known, well understood. Um, it's the risk that a digital currency can be spent twice. And actually, it's not just the risk, it's the risk that attacks are going to be based on this pot potential vulnerability, right? So it's not like it's going to be an inadvertent spend. It's, it's, it's going to be a deliberate attempt. So there are some solutions to this. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, we could probably spend more time talking about this. And uh, I hope that some folks here have some experience where we can get in some of these things if they'd like. But obviously, the consensus mechanisms, proof of stake, proof of work, although please don't do proof of work anymore. Um, you know, we need to get away from burning so many fossil fuels in order to power a, a new currency. Thank you very much. Um, reduction of the honeypot. So these are, you know, in a sense, um, techniques used to minimize the amount of funds at risk or potentially exposed. And so, you know, this implies a, a kind of, of, I don't know, hiving off or sharding of the uh, currencies so that you don't create, um, or some other set of controls so you don't create too much of a, of a honeypot for somebody to go after. Um, and one of those might be time limitations, a key one that, that we're, we're looking at. Um, limit uh, the duration that a token can exist without being, um, being, uh, being seen by, the, uh, by the, the, the DLT. Okay, so this is an exciting space, uh, but there are also some cautions. So here's the yellow caution. Um, or the orange caution here. So, you know, the, we've talked, I, I mentioned this already, but the ability to monitor versus privacy, um, we want to reduce potential for fraud, money laundering, et cetera, but we don't want to become too much of a, a, a monitoring state. Uh, this is, this, this is really, I think the, the tension. Uh, and then, you know, the central bank wants to control over the money in circulation, but uh, on the other hand, wants to preserve freedoms. So you want to have security around um, these things, smart contracts, you know, limit where your funds could be used to a geographic area, limit where your funds could be used on a time limitation basis. Uh, this raises a lot of questions. Uh, and then finally, you know, I think what's at stake is whether these things get defined by um, uh, by obscure standard bodies, or they get they get developed by uh, in, more in the open. Whether they get developed under the purview of democratic um, norms, or they are developed by non-accountable institutions, which could be private institutions, um, but it has implications for governments everywhere. So I think there's going to be a need to have elements of this fully in the open, not the security pieces, but but a lot of the features need to be out there and discussed and understood and worked on. All right. Final observation are um, two quotes. One is the, um, I'll just read this. The, the dollars to remain the world's primary reserve currency cannot remain an analog instrument, um, must become a digitized token current tokenized currency uh, that's from the US dollar project which was Federal Reserve funded um, and Janet Yellen fairly recently we do have a problem with financial inclusion too many Americans don't have access this is something that the digital dollar central bank digital currency could help with so it's she's hedging her bets there it could result in um, but those are some thoughts from some of the leaders in these institutions and I think it shows the direction uh, the that we are that we are traveling in. All right. Uh, with that, I will open it up to some 
questions and I wish I could bring you on visually, but Javier, uh, maybe we'll start with you. Hi. So my, my, my first question will be which, so um, what, what type of, of ledger are being used by these CBDCs? So are they using um, a private distributed ledger or are you using like uh, Ethereum or, or other public distributed ledgers? What, what are you seeing on this aspect? So, right. So we're um, in some of these, uh, in some of these private, uh, in some of these efforts that are showing up, they're, they're forks of, um, of Ripple or they're Ripple, um, the XRP, or they are um, Stellar is one of the groups involved. Um, uh, what are some of the others? Yeah. So they, these are technologies that were developed for um, stable coins. Mm -hmm. And so they're being proposed by the, by these uh, by these companies to be the solution to the CBDC set of challenges. And at the end of the day, I suspect that the groups or the technologies that are chosen will need to have a lot of openness to them. And so uh, to the extent that those blockchain technologies are not open, I, I think the, there will be, well, I don't even know why you would why you would even entertain a non-open, um, you know, non-open source or you know, a ledger system because a, a, a central bank would not want to have some one vendor. Um, I just don't think that's I don't think that's a that's a that's a way we will go. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, Charles Lambach. Does this process settle in real time? I think that when you were talking about the, the settlement and the inter inter interoperability of ledgers, you made that question. The CBDCs. So that's a good question. Um, So the notion of of clearing versus settling are um, oh it, is I, the Singapore CBDC to CBDC French testing. I think that now Charles is oh that was really uh, yeah yeah well so yes within certain windows right yeah okay so um, there there are rules there are rule sets. So that what that test was was a was an examination of whether you could with CBDCs do what you do today with um, existing fiat currencies. So in the existing setup between banks, you have you have participants in the settlement scheme that must follow certain rules, um, CBDC to, you know, or you know bank to bank, and so. Yes, whatever whatever they consider the window duration is what was being tested at a technological mm -hmm. basis. So so yes, it in it is in a sense immediate settlement. Okay, so that like the 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 the, the block closing is like the ten minutes that you need to close a, a block on, on blockchain that's the that's the window of immediate uh, um, uh, settlement that 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 can be done in real that can be uh, that, that can be the, the, the real time um, uh, way of seeing it no? or, or yeah. maybe yeah well so um so so look um in the um when you settle right between banks when you settle between banks uh you are settling the accounts and so the way this was done in the mercantile age was banks would have ledgers during the day and they would be recording transactions between their customers 
on their ledger. And so those were on us transactions, but then they would have customers who would be claiming funds from a different bank. And, and there would be an expectation that that bank would um, issue a, a pull um, on those funds. And so there was a trust relationship between these merchant banks, right? Uh, and at the end of the day, there would be a settlement mechanism. They would literally bring boxes of gold um, from one bank to the other to settle the accounts, right? And so that's settlement. It's it's the finality of transactions that have already occurred. Um, if the if there is a bank in that system that is turns out to be untrustworthy, then you have a settlement risk. And over time, the settlement risk has been mitigated by having things like um, settlement windows or by having things like uh, having reserve accounts with the central bank. And so these mechanisms reduce the settlement risk. So th the settlement systems that are already in place, the rule sets, I should say, the rule sets that are already in place will likely apply directly to central bank digital currencies. But we will soon find that there are some interesting aspects because clearing and clearing and settling are, are kind of notions that come with that that come from an age of disconnected um and marginally connected systems yeah and so once we have tokens that are moving around they are in a sense settling at the same time that they are clearing and that's i think an interesting um technology evolution good we have more questions um valentin Yuzunov, are there any roadmaps and implementations planned for cbdc with deadlines uh so um every central bank runs their own shop so you would look at if you wanted to understand what's going on in your country or in neighboring countries you would have to go to whatever that working group is and there are working groups in lots of places talking about what they're going to do the places where it's being discussed at a global level are places like the imf international monetary fund the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, mm -hmm. and um, at competitions like the Monetary Authority of Singapore running this competition that I that I mentioned. So that competition will result in a report, which I suspect will actually lay out some of the roadmaps for governments to consider. Um, all, you know, so you can look at what the Chinese are talking about. They have their own roadmap. Um, you can see what the European Union is talking about. You can see what the Federal Reserve are talking about and, and the government of Japan. Those are some major players in the currency world that are, that have their own separate roadmaps and their own separate working groups. I hope that answers that question a bit. So Valentino also is asking if the working, you find trusted up to date information. Uh, I think that, that, that link. You can share that link on the chat, uh, where you can find all the all the uh, CBDCs. I hope that with that name, now the medical cannabis regulation won't be <laughs> far from being accepted by the banks. With all CBDCs. No, just a joke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here, let me, I will send a couple of, of things here in the, in the chat window here, just to, um, so I wonder if, if, if this effort for central banks of, okay, uh, cryptocurrencies are here and, and, and we need to do something. So we need to just invent the wheel again. Uh, I wonder if, 
But we will see that that is something that it will be unveiled with time. Uh, we are running out of time now. Um, James, I don't know if you want to give like a, a summary or a final, and, and we have the next sessions in five minutes. Are actually already open. Ah, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, this will be posted on up on YouTube later. And uh, again, thanks everybody for attending. Bye now. Bye bye. I, I will put the session next session on the chat. So I'll see you there. Okay. On the CEO's panel. Terrific. See you. Bye, -bye. bye now.